this is Jerry with Vet Type Bites, and today I want to talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I'm going to go over clinical signs, etiology, and treatments, so that way you have something to take back to the clinic in my first segment of Vet Tech Breakdown. Alright, so I want to start off with the normal anatomy of and blood flow through the heart so that way we can get the basics down first, okay? So we know that blood flows to the heart from the cranial and caudal vena cava. That's this big old vein right here that goes from the rest of your body back to the heart. So it goes right in here into our right atrium. Right? This is where blood flow comes from the rest of the body. And then it goes through our tricuspid valve here and down into our right ventricle. And then it goes in our pulmonary artery, right this way, out to our lungs, and then back to our heart via the pulmonary vein, right here into our left atrium. And then it goes down through the bicuspid or mitral valve into our left ventricle where it goes out to the aorta into systemic circulation right and a couple other things to note about the anatomy this right here is going to be the interatrial septum down here this is going to be our interventricular septum because it's between both ventricles just like the other one was between the two atrium and this big old meaty section right here is known as the myocardium. The heart muscle, the thing that actually makes it pump. All right, and next I wanna go over what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy actually is, what it looks like and how it progresses. All right, so here I have two hearts side by side. One is a normal heart and one has HCM. So I wanna go over what classifies hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So HCM is classified as an increase in cardiac mass due to a hypertrophied, which just means thickened, non-dilated left ventricle in the absence of any other cause of ventricular hypertrophy, which we're not really gonna get into. All right, so the nature of the disease is the heart gets thicker and what a lot of people think is when the heart gets thicker it gets bigger which is not the case with hcm with hcm the heart gets it just gets thicker and more dense but it doesn't actually get much larger and you can see that here in the thickened myocardium right it's so much thicker and as a result the chamber of the left ventricle is drastically reduced so you can imagine, seeing as how the patient's blood volume is the same, how difficult this would be in actually getting that blood out into systemic circulation. So what ends up happening is this whole thing starts off with disorganization in the myocardium. It's, it gets disorganized due to a genetic component. That's the cause, it's just genetic. So disorganization in the myocardium leads to interstitial fibrosis, which basically means replacement scarring. Normal myocytes that would be contracting are then replaced with scar tissue that essentially prevents it from doing that. So as time goes on, the heart gets more stiff and less compliant, which leads to diastolic dysfunction which means it has a problem relaxing. If you think of systole as contraction, diastole would be relaxation, right? So if it has a problem relaxing, it can't really fill that ventricle anymore. And over time, as the size of the left ventricle gets smaller, you actually have an increase in left atrial pressure due to the backflow or reduced forward flow in the left ventricle. So you end up having this increased left atrial pressure that over a long period of time will actually cause it to dilate out like this. So there we will see dilation, but when left atrial dilation is present, that's how you know the disease has progressed to a fair point. And with this enlarged atrium, 
that leaves the potential for hemostasis, or blood just kind of sitting still, where it has the potential to clot, where it is one chamber away from going out into systemic circulation, which could lead to a thromboembolism. Some of you might know that as saddle thrombus, where they get an aortic thromboembolism and lose the ability to use their legs. As this backflow kind of occurs, this increase in pressure actually makes a backflow back to the lungs, and that's where we see that pulmonary, pulmonary edema, pleural effusion, all of those end-stage disease markers. And that's when you see the patients come in, open mouth breathing, respiratory distress, uh, usually have to give a bunch of diuretics and things like that to keep the, keep the lungs clear, and then, you know, start them on a bunch of medications, right? And that's sort of the nature of the disease. Um, it's a progressive disease, and there's not a whole lot that can be done to prevent or treat it. We more have to manage the clinical signs, and that sort of brings us to our next subject, which is clinical signs. How can you even tell if a patient may have HCM? Because it's a bit ambiguous, right? So let's go over clinical signs. Clinical signs. Um, are they having any coughing or retching? Like, are they trying to like hack something up, but they never produce anything? Um, not eating or drinking. Some patients stop eating or drinking uh, like a week or two before they actually go into heart failure. It's uh, it's about two weeks before. So if you're noticing things like that, it could be a sign that they're going to be going into heart failure soon. Um, a decreased energy level. Right? Are they just laying around more, not really wanting to do anything? Um, and on that note, are they having any exercise intolerance? Like, are they playing and all of a sudden they're open mouth breathing? You know, all, the, all, the, all of a sudden they can't really be active. Um, that That's pretty much it when it comes to clinical signs, aside from them all of a sudden not being able to walk or all of a sudden them not being able to breathe as if, as if they're going into heart failure. Um, so those are the kind of clinical signs that you might be able to, to look out for when you're there doing your, your cursory exam. And next up, let's get on to treatment. Like, what, what can we actually do about that, right? So usually you treat with beta blockers. Treat with beta blockers, right? So we know about beta blockers is they slow the heart rate. And the reason we want to slow their heart rate is, is because their left ventricle has a cap on its performance, essentially. All right, so I wanted to show you a graph to really visualize why it is we have to decrease HCM patients' heart rates in order to treat them. So as you can see in the white line, you have a normal patient, and a normal feline patient can have a heart rate up to, what, 2, 210, 220 in clinic, and they're just fine. At about 250, it starts really taking a dip down because their ventricles don't have enough time to really fill. When the heart is just beating constantly, there's not enough time for it to fill. And the reason that's so significant for us is because our patient has an even smaller left ventricle. So the faster it goes, the less it actually has to output. So if you can imagine having a very having a heart rate of about 90 to 100 now is going to be our patient's normal, 90 to 120, I would say. And any more than that, they really start to trend downwards because the heart simply cannot meet the demands. So. So I don't know if that kind of helps visualize it a little better, but like for me, that chart always kind of helps. All right, so going back to treatment, beta blockers for the reasons we just discussed. And uh, next up would be diuretics. Uh, the reason we start them on diuretics is when they get to a certain point, their heart cannot actually process their blood volume. It's, it's not as efficient as it was before. So the only way to really help them out is to decrease their blood volume, which is to basically keep them dehydrated for the rest of their lives because their heart can't process the amount of fluid necessary. So we start them on diuretics until they get to a certain point, in which case it's not really treatable. And that's about it though. Um, honestly, there's not a whole lot to be done about HCM. Um, 
every patient is different. Sometimes it progresses fast, sometimes it progresses slow, um, but it all kind of leads to the same conclusions. Um, so the plan is to treat symptomatically, keep them calm and relaxed. Um, typically the reason they come in, in respiratory distress is because they they don't really do a whole lot at home. Cats are known to be kind of lazy sometimes. So all of a sudden when they start doing activity, their heart starts to kick up like it normally is supposed to, however it can't do it. So they just come in in full-blown respiratory distress. And that's when they need oxygen, they need diuretics, they need to be given some time to really clear their lungs out. So that way they go home on probably beta blockers and or diuretics because they can't really process everything they have. All right, everybody, I really hope you enjoyed today's section of Vet Tech Breakdown. Um, I really did. Um, I'm sorry my art's kind of terrible, but I'm working on it. Um, but I really enjoyed having the kind of whiteboard session feel. Please feel free to leave a comment down below. Tell me if you liked it or didn't like it. Leave a like if you did. Don't if you didn't. I'm hoping to be doing these uh, kind of Vet Tech Breakdown sessions for a bunch of different other disease processes. So stay tuned for that. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss on anything coming soon. And I'm Jerry with Vet Tech Bites. Thanks so much for hanging out, and I will see you guys next time.